Recording this program is entirely fictional and made by a sole Canadian man. All characters and events in the show, including the host, even those that are based on real people, are entirely fictional. The following program contains mature subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. America, the land of the free, home of the brave, and the stupid, and the criminally insane. The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who've roamed our beloved streets causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight on Grand Theft Autobiographies. Guns, love, and drugs. We will take a look back at an America that still ran on the pager and the payphone. We will witness the rise of a criminal empire that dominated the southern United States in the mid-80s and get a closer look at the organization's reluctant boss and founder, a man who violently cut out a slice of the American dream through sweat, blood, and tears. Victor Vance. This episode of Grand Theft Autobiography is brought to you by... Double Alt Lager Beer. Get both barrels. Hey, Victor Van. Did anyone ever tell you you got a really dumb name? Very little is known about Victor's early life. His father emigrated from the Dominican Republic to the United States, where he worked as a soldier, while his mother, Janet Vance, was a drug-addicted thief who rarely showed any real interest in Victor or his siblings. While the exact fate of Vance's father remains unknown, it's thought that he abandoned the family or died when Victor was very young, resulting in Victor and his brothers Lance and Pete all being raised by their mother's sister Enid Vance, since Janet proved unwilling or unable properly care for her children. Victor's youngest brother, Pete, had a notoriously bad case of asthma and required expensive medication, something that wasn't helped by their layabout brother Lance, who rarely, if ever, contributed to bringing in money for food and medication, forcing Victor to act as the sole provider for his family at a young age. So you joined the army to get rich? Not exactly, but... You know, my dad, he came here from DR. We didn't have a lot of opportunities. Seeking to make money quickly in order to help pay for Pete's medical bills, by 1984, Victor, presumably in his late 20s, joined the army, where he earned the rank of corporal and was later assigned to serve at Fort Baxter in Vice City under Sergeant Jerry Martinez. There are plenty of opportunities for a man who knows the game to make real money. So, I don't want any trouble, man. Who wants trouble? Nobody. Everybody wants to relax, no trouble, and there's plenty of money to be made, nice and easy. Upon arrival at Fort Baxter, Martinez would manage to convince Victor to participate in his illegal drug smuggling operation with little resistance. Despite his reservations with the eccentric sergeant, Vic would quickly be pulled into a life of crime by Martinez, who has him perform pickups, both cash and product. Victor would also be introduced to one of Jerry's other regular employees, a gunrunner operating an ammunition depot in Viceport, Phil Cassidy. You must be Vic. Jerry told me about you. Hey, I used to be in the service. Vic's straight, no-nonsense attitude would consistently clash with Martinez's loose and carefree demeanor, and not long after joining the army, would result in Victor's dishonorable discharge. After retrieving a prostitute for Jerry from Starfish Island, along with a brand new sports car presented to Vic as a gift, he would return to Fort Baxter, only to be chastised by Sergeant Peppa, and promptly dismissed without pay. You brought a whore onto the base? Have you no shame, boy? Are you a moron? Is that it? Drugs, whores, you're out of here, soldier. You're a disgrace! Following Vic's dismissal, Phil Cassidy would set him up with a place to stay in Vice Port, as well as an offer of work. Shamed and unemployed, Victor would reluctantly give up any notion of earning legitimate income and embrace his criminal options. I'm sorry about Bruce, man. 
He was the best. Hey, I can still see the smile on his face when he shot that little gook. Bang. Working for Phil in order to keep paying his and his family's bills. Ironically, due to Phil's working under Martinez, Victor would once again be under Jerry's thumb, who would have the two continue to acquire hardware for Martinez to sell on the black market. The thing is, you work for Phil, and Phil, Phil works for me, which makes you my bitch's bitch. Figure that out. It was during this time that Phil referred Victor to his brother-in-law and head of the trailer park mafia, Marty J. Williams. What do you want, boy? Nothing. Are you Marty? No. Now get gone, boy. Bitch! Bitch! Get your sorry ass out here! I thought I told you to clean this shit up! Marty, Mary Beth's been sick. Don't be using that baby as an excuse, Louise, because I'll hit her as well as you. Are you Louise? I'm a friend of Phil's. Friend of Phil's? Well, why don't you say so, boy? I'm Marty J. Williams. At Marty's trailer on the southern edge of Little Havana, Victor would be introduced to Phil's sister, Marty's wife, Louise Williams and a mutual attraction would begin to develop between the two almost immediately. Despite Victor's otherwise violent and criminal lifestyle, his soft and kind-hearted approach to Louise, heavily contrasted by her husband's abusive and hateful demeanor, instantly drew her to him, and they would form a strong bond over the course of Vic's employment under Marty. Marty, a stereotypical wife-beating American redneck, would have Victor assist him in maintaining the small empire run by the trailer park mafia by bringing pressure down on local gangs like the Cholos. He would protect Marty's various business fronts, loan sharking offices, and brothels, all the while becoming increasingly hostile with Williams over his treatment of Louise. Eventually, an incident with Marty causes Louise to flee with the two's daughter, Mary Beth, to her sisters, where Victor would continue meeting with Williams despite working for Marty. I'm taking the baby and I'm going to stay with my sister! Good! Go ahead, go! After retrieving Louise's belongings from Marty's trailer, Victor would hear from Louise's sister Mary Jo that she'd been kidnapped by Marty and was being taken back to the trailer park. Perhaps already in love with Louise, Victor would rush to her rescue and against Louise's wishes, murder the abusive and racist Marty, as well as numerous goons working for the trailer park mafia. I can't believe you killed him! How am I gonna look after my baby now? You what? Marty was an asshole! He treated you worse than shit! I'm sorry! I just... Hey, look! Marty's kin are gonna be coming for you now! We better get you someplace safe! Not long after, Vic would be contacted again by Phil Cassidy for another job from Jerry Martinez. However, by this point, the two arms traffickers had worn out their usefulness to the ruthless sergeant, something even the drunk and detached Phil was suspicious of. Desperate for money, though, Phil would agree to the job for Martinez, and Vic would agree to help him just in case Jerry's true intentions were to eliminate his new friend. Turns out, they were both correct. Hey, fellas, Martinez said... Yeah, Martinez said bye-bye. Hot damn! Play fair, fellas. What about the damn Geneva Convention? Once again unemployed, Luis would suggest to Vic the idea of picking up where Marty had left off, by taking over his various business assets and running them himself. With Louise's head for business, Victor would begin liquidating and rebuilding Marty's fronts, as well as begin employing his own staff to assist in running his slow-grown empire. And thus, the Vance crime family was born. With help from Louise, Victor would begin growing his empire well beyond Marty's original reach. He would take over numerous businesses from both the Vice City bikers, as well as the Cholos who had been a consistent problem even for Marty beforehand. During his rapid rise to prominence within the Vice City underworld, Victor would be contacted by an anonymous family member looking to assist him in growing his empire. Upon arrival at Escobar International, however, Vic would be surprised by the less than welcome sight of his younger brother, Lance. Hey, bro! <laughs> Lance! Hey! What are you doing here? You don't sound so pleased! Lance, a constant source of aggravation for the eldest Vance brother, had traveled to Vice City eager to help Vic in climbing the ladder of criminal enterprise. Lance's arrival, however, couldn't have come at a more dangerous time, as Vic was constantly under attack by rival gangs looking to retake territory from the expanding Vance crime family, and one such attack would prompt the two brothers into a high-speed chase from the airport, ending in Lance crashing the stinger he'd received from Jerry Martinez and an enormous shootout against dozens of cholos seeking to kill Vic. You're never driving again! I had it with you, man! 
You put me off. You always treat me like a kid. Now saddled with his younger brother's antics, Vic would continue expanding his empire and making connections, with only the thinnest veil of legitimacy remaining in Vic's few legal businesses. He would first strike up an alliance with Cuban gang leader Umberto Rabina, following Marty's death, by proving his mettle in a collection race, and upon becoming partners, begin accelerating a war against the Cholos, who continue to harass both Cuban and Vance crime family businesses across Little Havana and beyond. Eventually, Vance and Rabina would put the final nail in the Cholos by decimating one of their supply warehouses and killing both their leader and dozens of gang members in the process. We turn the tide in Little Havana! The Cholos are finished! Following the Cholo's elimination, Umberto and Vic would split their remaining business assets and solidify their relationship as trustworthy allies to each other. During this time, Vic would also assist Louise Williams in keeping her child when social services threatened to take Mary Beth away due to Louise's poor parenting skills and dangerous lifestyle. Despite the two's interest in each other, Vic's increasingly violent and time-consuming work would mean they saw less and less of each other as Victor continued growing the band's crime empire. Lance, not content with sitting on the sidelines whilst Vic ran the business, would begin snooping around Vice City's underbelly looking for connections, hoping to find a score liable to make the two brothers rich. As it happens, naive and gullible Lance would very quickly meet an individual who claimed he could arrange just that in Brian Forbes, whom Lance begins working with regarding a substantial quantity of drugs that Forbes was looking to offload. Despite his suspicions, Vic would assist Lance in retrieving Forbes' impounded vehicle containing the drugs, and go on to use two separate delivery vans, one real and one decoy, to transport the drugs once again in preparation for a large sale. Before any such sale could take place, however, Lance would confront Forbes after learning that he was an undercover DEA agent, likely building a case against the brothers, and the two would be forced to chase down Brian before taking him to a warehouse for interrogation. Whilst holding Forbes hostage, the Vance brothers would attempt to extract information out of him regarding a real large-scale drug deal taking place in the city, but come up short due to Forbes' lack of true cooperation. Twice over, Forbes would try having the Vance brothers eliminated in a setup. First, at a phony drug deal where Lance is nearly kidnapped himself, and finally at a bar owned by the white nationalist neo-Nazi outfit, the White Stallions, where Vic and Lance were forced to fight their way back to the safe house. When they arrived, they would find Brian in the midst of an escape attempt, and Victor would quickly pursue and put down Forbes in the middle of the street, before collecting the agent's ID badge and returning to the Vance compound. Presumably after combing Forbes' apartment, Lance would find information detailing the arrival of files related to an enormous drug shipment bound for Vice City in the coming weeks. And after a brief encounter with their addict mother Janet, in town likely looking for free drugs from her criminal sons, Lance and Vic would meet a contact at Escobar International, apparently selling the confidential files, only to arrive moments too late, the seller having sold the files to a group of bikers who beat the brothers to the punch. What the hell are they doing here? I'm guessing we're not the only ones your contact turned away today. I'll get the file. They would go on to track the bikers down where Lance, after Vic's firefight with the guards, would obtain the files and quickly return them to their hotel. Whilst Victor remained adamant that he was uninterested in becoming a drug dealer and wasn't even particularly happy he was running a criminal business to begin with, his attitude would change once Lance revealed the drug shipment he intended to intercept belonged to none other than Jerry Martinez. Looking to make things even with the man who, from his perspective, forced him into his life of crime to begin with, Vic would agree to helping Lance seize the shipment for future sale through Victor's empire. Jerry Martinez! It's his coke! Uh, fuck it. You know what? Let's do it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is a real man. Let's pop it. Little Haiti. Some would call it an American slum. Others would call it home. But not far beneath the surface level, brothels, cab depots, and low-income housing lies another branch of the underworld's network for shady deals. Drugs, weapons, people. It was here at the western docks of Little Haiti that Victor and Lance intercepted Martinez's shipment, seizing the two full truckloads of cocaine after slaughtering Jerry's goons guarding the vehicles. Martinez would pursue the two brothers en route to their safe house in a hunter-attack helicopter, but be forced to retreat upon the arrival of the VCPD. After losing the police, Vic and Lance would safely store the drugs at Lance's new penthouse, which he'd purchased on credit, assuming the brothers were about to be richer than their wildest dreams. Alongside Lance's new pad, Victor would also begin living in relative luxury at the Climate of Suite in Vice Point, 
years before the area would be substantially redeveloped into office buildings. It seemed that the Vance brothers had finally caught a break, or so they thought. While phoning Martinez to gloat about their successful theft of the shipment, Vic would learn that Jerry had only been a middleman for much larger players in Vice City's criminal hierarchy, and that in reality, the shipment had belonged to the Mendez brothers of the well-organized and powerful Mendez cartel. Yeah. Thanks for the coke, Martinez. <laughs> now you know how it feels to get fucked. Oh, you fucked us both, Vic. That coke you ripped off belonged to the Mendez brothers. I was just the shepherd. Now, we're all on their shit list, and the only way off is in a fucking bag. I'm turning states. I'm gonna ruin you, your brother, Mendez, everyone. Happy holidays. Lance, you useless degenerate asshole! Furious with his brother, but too deep in now to pull back, Vic would sit and wait until Lance could find a buyer, which thankfully he quickly did in Spitz, a rising horror director filming in Vice City. At the North Point Mall, Lance would meet with the director to discuss the details, while Victor would briefly work for Spitz as a stuntman due to an absentee, and managed to impress the director with his performance for an upcoming zombie apocalypse film. With the details agreed upon, Vic and Lance would head out to collect the product from Lance's penthouse, during which time Vic would receive a page from Spitz referring him to an industry friend of his working at Interglobal Films, named Rennie Wasselmeyer. At the penthouse, however, the brothers would find their entire shipment of cocaine gone, along with their addict mother and new boyfriend Javier, who had been consistently hanging around Lance looking for free hits. With the two concluding that their mother had indeed stolen the drugs, they wouldn't be given much time to dwell on it, as not long after, the Mendez cartel would begin an assault on Victor's businesses across the entire city. Damn! What? <laughs> there might be a little problem. Vic and Lance, along with several Vance crime family associates, would participate in the first all-out war against the cartel's forces, but successfully managed to push back the attacks due in no small part to Victor's rapid investment into his empire and the growing number of soldiers in his organization. Irritated but not deterred, the Mendez brothers Armando and Diego would change tactics and instead initiate a meeting with Vic and Lance to forge a business alliance where the two may both benefit. Ah, siblings, just like me and Diego. How apt. Listen, Mendez, we don't want no crap. Shit, that damn. Oh. Hey, mother... Listen, Vance brothers, you want me to kill you now? No problem. Or we can work together. Your call. The hell kind of choice is that? All right, I guess we're gonna work together. Under the threat of death if they refused, the Vance brothers would agree and begin working directly for the Mendez cartel. But it wouldn't take long for Lance's own, perhaps inherited tendency towards addiction to land the brothers right back under the microscope when Armando began noticing consistent losses in their profits that Lance was snorting right up his nose. Unbeknownst to Victor, Lance would cover for himself by feigning ignorance and blaming the product loss on their former associate Jerry Martinez, a fact for which Armando demanded immediate proof. Lance, knowing that Martinez had turned state's evidence and was in the witness protection program, would go on to use Forbes' DEA ID, a photo of Martinez, and some impromptu stitch work to create a convincing forgery of Jerry's supposed government ID. Surprisingly, this ruse convinces the Mendez brothers, who accept the explanation and continue employing the Vance brothers to serve as enforcers and hitmen for the cartel, and even have Victor use a specialized helicopter to retrieve product lifted by the VCPD. It was during this time, as the profiles for both Lance and Victor continued to rise, especially for the authorities, that Vic would learn Lance's house had become bugged by the DEA, forcing the two to destroy several police radio transmitters across town in an effort to prevent the police from acquiring any incriminating evidence against the two. You stupid gorilla! The place is bugged! The DEA is on to us! Happy now! At some point, Victor, through Spitz, would contact and begin working for film director and eccentric radio personality, Remy Wasselmeyer. Darling, it is the story of the age, success and failure. Vic would perform as a stuntman on several occasions, all the while greasing the cokehead for contacts interested in Victor's criminally inclined bodyguard services, the first of which being a man named Gonzalez. Gonzalez, right-hand man to South American colonel and Vice City socialite Juan Garcia Cortez, was conducting private deals behind his boss's back by cutting his cocaine shipments, and would employ Victor to assist in ensuring the deal's safe conclusion. Remy would also put Victor in contact with music manager Barry Micklethwaite and his client Phil Collins, for whom Victor would also serve as a bodyguard in general security, protecting the rock star from Ferrelli mobsters, whom Barry was in massive debt to. 
Look, Barry, when I agreed to play Vice City, I didn't expect it to be my swan song. It's no problem, mate. Just some nutcase trying it on. Hey, aren't you? Phil, mate. Phil Collins. Let's do the meet and greet another time, I. Come on! During this time, Victor would become increasingly suspicious of his brother's role in the consistently missing coke supplies. Lance would even go so far as to blame missing product on the bikers and have the two storm a biker-controlled front in search of drugs that were never there to begin with, just to cover his own addiction. Victor would finally learn the truth, however, when one day he arrived at Lance's penthouse only to catch him red-handed, or white-nosed, high as a kite on their own product. So this is where the coke is going? Up your nose? Hey, Vic! Hey, Vic! Uh, what are you doing here? You had me running around town like a psycho, and all the while you're siphoning it off for your personal use. You are unbelievable! Hey, I'm I'm sorry. Uh, look, can, can we talk about this later? Oh, <laughs> hey, Vic. <laughs> Shit. Louise, what the hell is going on? Well, uh, um, uh, uh, bro. <sighs> hey, hey, bro, it ain't nothing like that. I wouldn't do that to you. I just needed something to take my mind off things. So you fucked my brother? No. no! We just get high together. God damn, you are so judgmental, like you're a damn saint or something. Why are you being such an asshole? You are a mess. And you're wonderful. A wonderful drug dealing, thieving oh, murderer. Come on, guys. I was doing it for us. Who are you trying to kid? You don't give a shit about me. Not now, I don't. You know what? You make me want to puke, you self righteous dick. Ah, uh, get lost. Stay away from me, you sick bastard. You're a phony, Vic Vance. What are you gonna do? Thanks a lot, Lance. What? Listen, who cares? It's my coke. It's all my coke, and I'll do with it whatever I damn well please. To make matters worse, Vic would learn that Louise was also getting high with Lance, and Vic assumed was sleeping with him as a means of payback for not calling her enough. Louise and Lance would both adamantly deny the relationship, but the damage had been done, and a hysterical Lance would storm from the home and proceed to dump numerous packages of product into the ocean from his helicopter. Packages Victor luckily managed to retrieve using another of Lance's superfluous purchases, a hovercraft. Not long after, Louise would phone Vic to ask for help in dealing with threats from Jerry Martinez's men, something Vic does out of love for Louise despite his anger and suspicions that she may have slept with his brother. His anger is superseded by concern, however, when Martinez's threats manifest, and Louise is kidnapped, forcing Victor to rescue her and deliver her safely to the hospital. With Louise safe, Victor would continue working for contacts through Remy, the final one being aspiring drug kingpin Ricardo Diaz, a short man with a massive ego looking to exploit the various underworld elements of Vice City and manipulate his way to being on top. Diaz, who had become aware of Gonzalez's after-hour deals, would employ Vic and Lance to follow Gonzalez's men and steal the shipment in order to trade it to the DEA for a massive quantity of illegal arms. Gonzalez, ignorant of the Vance brothers' involvement in his stolen deal, would then also employ Victor to help protect him from Diaz, who was blackmailing him to inform on all his boss's future deals and defend one of his boss's shipments as they left Escobar International Airport. Following a brutal assault by the Diaz-connected sharks, Gonzalez would temporarily flee Vice City along with this colonel's merchandise. It was around this time that the Vance brothers were summoned once again to meet the Mendez brothers, where Armando revealed to Vic and Lance that they had outrun their usefulness and become a burden on the Mendez cartel. In an act of criminal good faith, they would offer the Vance brothers their freedom, in exchange for turning over all their business assets and leaving the city immediately. But Victor, appalled at the demands, would refuse Armando, resulting in them both being knocked unconscious and dragged to a fuel depot east of the airport to be executed. No place good. I think we outlived our usefulness to the Mendezes. You! Shut up! Hey! They're waking up! Let's get this done quick! Screw this! Die! <laughs> Thanks to the incompetence of their assassins, however, the brothers would survive and manage to escape the depot. Now that's what I'm talking about! Great! Now we're at war with the Mendez brothers! Now in a full-scale gang war against the Mendez cartel, Lance would round up assistance from their allies including Umberto Rubina and Phil Cassidy to help defend their businesses, and after an intense city-wide struggle, the Vance brothers would come out on top 
having pushed back Armando and Diego's assault. Their victory would be short-lived, however, as soon after, Vic would learn from Lance that Martinez was planning to kidnap Louise again as she got out of the hospital. Vic would rush to protect her, only to find Louise completely safe, and receive a page from Lance telling him he'd become trapped on the roof of a burning building. Vic and Louise would steal a medical helicopter and rescue Lance, who'd realize now that the threat on Louise had been a setup to catch him and get his money. After helping Lance retrieve the stolen cash from a boat off the coast, Vic would bring Louise home and return to the Diaz mansion to meet up again with his brother. He would learn that Lance was once again in debt, and this time to Diaz, and in order to square the payment, they would need to continue their campaign against the Mendez brothers, so that Diaz could take their place. Using state-of-the-art remote control technology, Vic would hijack the controls to Diego's robotic servant, Domestabot, and use it to set fire to the contents of their safe, hampering the finances of the Mendez cartel, and opening up the brothers to a final assault in the future. Following their betrayal by the Mendez brothers, Vic would be contacted yet again by Remy Wasselmeyer, whose life was now being threatened by Diego, a former lover of Remy's, for introducing Victor to Diaz. Vic would assist Remy in escaping his pursuers and deliver him to the hospital in Ocean Beach for his fourth sex change, back into a woman. Vic would also be given one more opportunity through Remy to work for Phil Collins, protecting him from an attempt by Giorgio Ferrelli to kill the British rock and roller for the debt owed to him by Phil's manager. After successfully preventing an attempt by the Ferrelli men to sabotage the concert, Victor would bid farewell to Remy, Collins, and Micklethwaite as he prepared for a reckoning with the Mendez brothers. Mate, that's it. I'm paying Giorgio back. It's gonna cost me a bloody fortune. You know, he wants 60% interest. What can I do? I've got to think of me boy's well-being. Hi, Vic. What do you think of the show? Killer. Cheers. Hey, Barry. I'm glad you're thinking of my well-being. I could do with a break. No, mate! We should be moving on! Strike while the iron's hot! The US loves you! But I'm booked in at the hotel for another week. I was gonna work on the tan. You're kidding! You gotta to go to work, mate! I've just lined up a rake of shows. Loads of dosh! And what about my well-being? Trust me, you'll thank me. Don't get all histrionic! Despite the mounting pressure, at this time, Vic and Louise would also make plans for a first actual date. But when Victor arrived at Lance's house to pick her up, she would be nowhere to be found, and the brothers would instead be confronted by Louise's sister, Mary Jo, who told them that her sister had been kidnapped again, this time by the Mendez brothers themselves. Nobody laid a finger on me, but they got Louise! Who's got Louise? They got her, and they said they'll kill her if you don't do what they want! Who? Armando Mendez! Oh. Lance would attempt to dissuade Vic from pursuing her, but to no avail, as soon after the two brothers would rush to the Mendez mansion on Prawn Island for revenge. At the mansion, Lance would storm the building before Vic could provide backup, forcing him to push through the gang members solo as he made his way to Louise. Barricade the door! Kill them! You're mine, motherfucker! Kill this idiot! Inside, Vic would be confronted by Armando for a final time, who claimed Lance and Louise both already dead, and that Vic was next. But after an intense battle, Vic would come out on top. He would move as fast as he could to rescue Louise, but upon finding her at Lance in the study, he would quickly realize he'd been too late. Vic, you came for me. No one ever really did much for me before. That's sweet of you. Hey, hey, come on, let's, let's get you to a hospital. I don't think there's much point in that. Come on, Louise. We could have had something special. Yeah. No, we did have something special. Make sure Mary Jo takes care of my baby. <laughs> oh, Louise. <sighs> Louise. Uh, uh. Hey, I, Vic, I, I know you cared about her, man. But she wasn't right for you. Vic. Hey, Vic. Family's what matters. Oh, damn. All right. All right. Make it. I can make it, I know I can, man.
With little time to mourn her death, Lance and Vic would meet up once again with Ricardo Diaz to plan the downfall of their remaining enemies, Diego Mendez and Jerry Martinez, who'd forged another temporary alliance in an effort to take Vic down. Gathering help from the distraught Phil, mourning the death of his sister, the two would break into Fort Baxter, where Victor's journey in Vice City all began, and steal a hunter-attack helicopter to be used in a final barrage against Mendez and Martinez, bunkered into an office building downtown. With everything set for the attack, Victor would bid farewell to Diaz and fly to the Mendez building by the Vice City Arena. I just got in some crazy donkey porn. You'll love it. I'll be finished with it by the time you get back. I'm not coming back, Diaz, and I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing it for me. Woohoo! Whatever you say, tough guy. I'll see you around. <laughs> with military precision, Victor would devastate the forces inside the building before landing on the roof and searching for his rivals. After a violent push through the top floors, Vic would find Diego and chase him all the way back to the roof, where Martinez would ambush him and force the three into a Mexican standoff. Ten hut! <laughs> Vic! I swear to God, I thought you were gonna salute me! Toss the gun! Fuck you! Vic! Still so uptight! You know what your problem is? You're trying to be the good guy in a bad man's game! Huh? I thought you had potential. Turns out you're just another chump, like Mendez. Me cago en tu madre. Oh, yes, sir. ¿Qué hay de nuevo? Vete a la mierda. You first. In the end, Victor would once again emerge the last man standing, just in time for Lance to arrive in classic fashion. Moments too late to provide actual assistance. With Martinez and the Mendez brothers dead, Vic and Lance agree to lie low and cut their losses, being very wealthy men. Though Lance would prod Vic with acquiring more cocaine for future deals, which Vic immediately shut down. Victor would send a substantial sum of money to their brother Pete, and the two men would eventually settle down in Mexico, where they purchased a small villa, and with that the Vance crime family would slowly fade from Vice City's criminal network. By 1986, however, Lance would manage to talk Victor into offloading some of the cocaine they'd acquired, or perhaps a new product that the two had begun growing. It isn't clear. Either way, Victor had set up a deal with Ferelli Mobsters out of Liberty City for $2 million worth of their coke, and Lance would personally fly the two remaining Vance crime family members to the deal, taking place in Vice Port. Victor would meet with Ferelli made man Tommy Rossetti and begin to hand him the product, but before the transaction could be completed, Hitman in hiding would unleash a slew of heavy machine gun fire into the group of four men, killing nearly all of them, including Victor Vance. Lance would flee the encounter and go on to form an unsteady business partnership with the other survivor, Tommy Versetti, where the two would eventually learn the attack had been orchestrated by none other than Ricardo Diaz. Working with Tommy, Lance would finally avenge his brother's death when the two men assaulted the Diaz mansion and finally brought the arrogant coke lord to his knees. This is for my brother! I trusted you, Tommy! <laughs> I would have had you made. Say good night, Mr. Diaz. Victor Vance is a reluctantly violent man, losing his father at a young age and being essentially abandoned by his drug addicted mother. Vic would be forced to take on the role of man of the house very early on and help guide his two younger brothers. 
He would also do absolutely anything for his family, even if some of them drive him mad. And this dedication seems to know essentially no bounds, having killed to save and provide for his family throughout his time as a criminal warlord for Vice City, and perhaps even before. Often strict and unbreakably serious, Victor was by some accounts a very kind and soft-hearted man to those he cared for, and was fiercely defensive of both women and children, showing no hesitation in protecting Louise even when her husband was still his boss. Despite these surface-level good qualities, Victor, like all subjects of GTA biographies, is capable of being a relentless and cold-blooded killer, as evidenced by the massive size of the Vance crime family at its peak, and the enormous trail of bodies he left in his wake on the road to achieving it. Victor was, in this sense, perhaps the most normal as compared to the average American, and for this reason, he is perhaps more terrifying than any other subject we've yet examined. Even with clear empathy for loved ones and a demonstration of true friendships and passionate love, Victor represents the reality that any one of us deep down may be capable of horrendous things when we're in the wrong place at the wrong time. And all it takes is crossing that line once. You can never come back. Vic Vance is a short and muscular man with dark skin and most often a shaved head, though later he would stop shaving and have short, balding black hair. He has been known to dress in numerous styles, mostly gang related, and his most common look was a blue polo shirt, stonewashed jeans, and a black watch with white sneakers. Having served in the military for a time, he was also seen occasionally in official army garb whilst on duty, and later, upon moving to Mexico, would adopt a much looser and traditional style of dress along with his receding hairline. At the time of his death, he had put on weight and was significantly less muscular than a couple years prior. He would also grow out his mustache and adopt a Latin American accent during his final deal, perhaps as a tribute to his father from the Dominican Republic. As we touched on previously, Victor Vance was an unconventionally empathetic criminal, at least some of the time. Simultaneously, he was also a force to be reckoned with, and carries a substantial body count like all of our subjects on this program. Don't allow Victor's occasional compassion to fool you. He was a ruthless killer, and the numbers we are about to go over will demonstrate that. That being said, let's have a look at the final tallies for St. Victor of Vance. Taking part in a drug deal that goes awry, and hiding a package of drugs for Jerry Martinez under his bed at the barracks. Killing several cholos in order to retrieve Phil Cassidy's money that he owes to Jerry Martinez. Killing several party bullies and bringing a prostitute back to Fort Baxter. Helping Phil Cassidy perform a drive-by shooting on a cholo. Helping Phil Cassidy and two other men perform a drive-by shooting on a truck transporting weapons, and stealing said truck for Jerry Martinez. Vandalizing a shop under the protection of the cholos to convince its owner to accept Marty J. Williams' protection instead. And killing several cholo guards guarding the shop. Stealing three cars for Marty. Destroying three cholo vans to ruin their repossession business, and killing several cholos attempting to stop him. Assaulting a cholo prostitution business and taking it over for Marty. Killing several cholos attacking Marty's prostitutes. Killing Jerry Martinez's men that ambush him and Phil Cassidy. Killing several trailer park mafia members standing in his way to retrieve Louise's items from Marty's trailer. Killing Marty J. Williams as well as Hank and several other trailer park mafia members attempting to stop him from going after Marty. Taking over Marty's businesses by force killing the remaining Trailer Park Mafia members in the process, killing numerous cholos chasing him and Lance, stealing a fire truck to save his burning brothel, and killing Marty's cousin, killing several thugs attacking a welfare man who threatened to take Louise's baby and scaring the man off, killing several thugs who attempted to rob the King Nuts Burger Bar, and escaping from the pursuing BCPD officers who have mistaken him and Lance for the robbers, and stealing Brian Forbes' impounded car back for him, engaging in a violent competition for a package and killing Gilberto, helping the Cubans kill numerous cholos causing havoc in Little Havana, helping the Cubans steal weapons from a cholo warehouse, killing the cholos attempting to stop them, and destroying the warehouse with a piñata disguised bomb afterwards, causing mayhem in the streets to attract police attention, acting as a decoy, while Brian Forbes and Lance deliver drugs to a warehouse, chasing and kidnapping Brian Forbes alongside Lance, attempting to ambush a drug deal that Forbes tips him and Lance off about, infiltrating the ship where the dealer and his men take Lance, killing all the guards in order to save Lance, and stealing their drug shipment killing all members of the White Stallions at their bar after being lured into a trap by Forbes, chasing and killing Forbes and stealing his ID, stealing a drug shipment from a private plane at the airport and killing both his guards and several bikers attempting to steal the shipment as well, stealing a large drug shipment that he and Lance believe belonged to Jerry Martinez, killing Martinez's men Guardian, and escaping from both Martinez and a hunter and the VCPD, owning and operating a vast criminal enterprise across Vice City, killing numerous people pretending to be zombies during the filming of a movie, killing numerous Mendez cartel members attacking his businesses, taking photos of Jerry Martinez with a DEA agent and creating fake IDs by combining Martinez's ID with Brian Forbes to trick the Mendez brothers, 
taking over a Vice City biker's business by force, killing all the bikers guarding it, killing two drug dealers who angered the Mendez brothers, as well as the second dealer's prostitute guards attacking him, retrieving two containers of drugs confiscated by the VCPD using a helicopter, destroying the DEA antennas that have collected evidence against him and Lance, and escaping from the VCPD officers pursuing him afterwards, killing numerous bikers alongside Lance in retaliation for the theft of their cocaine, killing numerous Martinez goons who kidnapped Louise in order to save her, escorting Gonzalez's drug shipment and killing all the attackers who attempt to steal it, killing several hitmen of the Ferrelli crime family who attempt to kill Barry Micklethwaite and Phil Collins, killing more Ferrelli hitmen under the stadium who attempt to sabotage Phil's concert, killing Jesus, doing a drug deal for Gonzalez, accidentally inhaling some of the drugs and driving under the influence, killing the dealers who attacked him and recovering the van full of drugs for Gonzalez, chasing one of Gonzalez's goons, stealing a boat full of drugs belonging to Gonzalez for Ricardo Diaz, and killing all of Gonzalez's men who attempt to stop him, overwatching an arms deal between Diaz's men and a DEA agent and killing all the attackers who ambushed the deal, escorting Gonzalez to the airport and killing all the attackers who attempt to kill him, killing all Mendez cartel members who kidnapped him and Lance in order to save the latter and escape from the airport fuel depot before it explodes, killing more Mendez cartel members who attack their businesses, stealing a helicopter from the hospital and taking Lance to a boat to kill Jerry Martinez's men who tried to kill him, hacking the Mendez brothers' domestobot and using it to break into their safe and destroy their bearer bonds, making them bankrupt, killing several Mendez cartel members arriving at Interglobal Film Studios to prevent them from learning that Remy is gone, and killing more members who attacked and trapped Remy in order to save her, killing several frilly hitmen during Phil's concert who tried to sabotage it once again, killing several Mendez cartel members who attacked Lance on his way to the Mendez brothers' mansion, assaulting the mansion and killing Armando Mendez in order to save Lance and Louise, stealing a hunter from Fort Baxter, using the stolen hunter to assault Diego Mendez's office building, killing the last remaining Mendez cartel members throughout the building, and killing Diego and Jerry Martinez on the rooftop, engaging in a drug deal with Tommy Versetti, and getting killed during it. Oh, shit. With a final estimated murder count of 443, Victor is easily able to stand amongst the rest of the vicious subjects we've examined on this program, with his final tallies almost certainly being much, much higher, due to uncountable murders during Victor's power grab on Vice City's underworld, in which numerous deaths went uncounted. Remember America, this man was in your armed services, and so his destructive capabilities may lie all around us, in the people we suspect the least. America is a dangerous place, folks. When even our armed servicemen can wind up as criminal kingpins with cocaine farms in Mexico, what chance does the average Joe and Betty have? Not as far as this reporter can tell. Victor Vance is a prime example of the raw, destructive potential lying in wait within all able-bodied Americans, even the liberals. Stay indoors, people. You never know where the next gun-toting lunatic might crawl out from. It might even be the person standing right next to you. Until next time, I'm your host, Guinness Walker, and this has been Grand Theft Autobiographies. Thank you.